kink should not be conflated with LGBT. There's a lot of events that are like LGBT leather weekend or something. And I'm like, you're not doing anyone a favor by conflating your immutable characteristics, which I believe sexual orientation is. You can't choose to be gay. You can't choose to be straight with certain habits that people choose to engage in that have stigma. And look, I'm not even a huge stigma person. Like, I really don't care. But I'm simply, my point is, don't conflate these things. We didn't fight mm -hmm. for gay rights to then have it be tainted as the same thing as, you know, masochism and BDSM. Welcome to the Veritas Podcast. I'm Scott Veritas, and today I'm joined by journalist, commentator, and podcaster Brad Palumbo. Brad, thanks so much for being on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you on. Uh, I followed you for, for a while, and, and I, I wanted to, just for people who maybe aren't as familiar with your work, start off by asking you if you would talk a little bit about who you are, your background, and particularly how did you find yourself becoming somewhat of this libertarian, conservative uh, commentator who's also, I think, I think you're pretty close to me in age. You're kind of a millennial voice in that space as well. How did you find yourself in that position? Yeah, so it's kind of a funny story, actually, but I went to uh, college at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And folks uh, might know UMass because they have the number one food in the nation, but they also happen to have the only uh, openly Marxist, like not a pejorative, like they would call themselves that economics department in the continental United mm -hmm. States. And so I just went there because it was a state school and it was cheap and I was from Massachusetts. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I, I wanted to study economics and I went into this Marxist department and I very quickly realized, uh, guys, this is not for me. And then, you know, it was one of those very hard left social justice campuses where they would try to shut down speakers. They had a, a cry in the day that Trump won. Uh, all the classes, you, you just essentially had a therapy session to talk about your fifis and cry. Uh, it, it was pretty absurd. They had free speech zones, all this. So my right. college experience really kind of pushed me towards a right of center political ideology and worldview because I was so repulsed by all the hard left. But then it took me you know, a, a few years of, of reading and studying and writing and thinking about ideas to kind of figure out what did that mean for me, you know, coming at it from the perspective of somebody who's not particularly religious, who's not, who is gay. Uh, I don't think I was ever very drawn to hardcore social conservatism, old, old style social conservatism. Uh, but I also wasn't exactly drawn to Trump, wasn't a huge fan of him. Uh, and so, especially at that time, it's like, okay, well, what do I believe? I know I'm not on the left, but I'm somewhere on the right. Uh, and I found myself kind of semi-drawn uh, towards, like, as the least of all the bad options, Gary Johnson uh, in 2016. So that's who I voted for. Um, and then just, you know, exploring kind of libertarian and libertarian adjacent thought in economics, whether it's Hayek or Mises or Milton Friedman or Thomas Sowell are my two favorites. And then reading a lot of, of kind of liberty and right of center ideas and arguments and magazines and that kind of thing. And then a lot of what I learned was through doing. So I started at the campus newspaper. I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, but I actually started at the campus newspaper just to like join a club and do something and meet people. And I really liked it, especially in the opinion section and, and mm. kind of the the drama of it and the vitriol and the backlash that I would get when I published a <laughs> column that was even slightly milk toast right of center. And so in response to all that, I kind of ended up making a career out of it and then learning by doing, you know, whenever I wrote about something, I would research it, I would look it up, I would think about it a lot and I would learn. So now I've learned about all sorts of things and become something of a spokesperson for these ideas on various subjects, mostly just through that process, actually, of interviewing experts, of reporting stories, of researching something for an op-ed. Uh, and yeah, and I think, like you said, with the being on the younger side, I'm only 24, um, that has brought me into kind of a unique space where a little bit more in touch with young people, with TikTok, with Instagram, with YouTube. I'm actually probably going to start streaming on Twitch soon. Uh, mm -hmm. but that, that it will be new to me, but just that's the void that I've been trying to fill is because a lot of, you know, the, the Liberty movement and our media circles is very, 
backwards looking. And so I want to be mm. kind of next generation forward looking in terms of uh, media influence. Yeah, the Twitch thing is interesting. It's it's blown up a lot in the past few years, and I'm actually thinking of trying to get into that space myself, but it's a, a hard place to kind of learn the ropes in. Uh, I wanted to ask, though, I mean, you're working in this sort of media space, and you are on the right, but of course, everyone knows, I would be very surprised if, if you were to take attention to this, the media space is a pretty left-leaning space, especially at a lot of legacy media outlets. I'm curious kind of what you think should be done about that as a journalist who is more so a little bit on the right, even if you are you know, an opinion journalist, still, still an important kind of journalism. What do you think people should be doing about that? Because people constantly talk about media bias and what's going on in the media world, but it seems like it's hard to come up with exactly what solutions should be put in place. Like, do you think it's something where it's something where that industry has to be reformed in a sort of subtle way, or does it need to be, you know, burned to the ground, as some people say? I think it's it's actually neither. I think it's kind of like a slow bleed in that they're just losing, like the Washington Post is losing millions. They're just slowly dying, these legacy media institutions. Mm-hmm. The New York Times will cling on forever, but it's like the share of mainstream establishment media is shrinking. People are watching less cable television. People are reading way fewer newspapers. And we're seeing the rise of things like podcasts, things like YouTube, things like influencers and news from TikTok and all this stuff. And I think it's going to be a slow bleed that all of a sudden, 10, 20 years from now, we'll wake up and realize the legacy media is almost completely irrelevant. They're still certainly relevant mm. now, but it's like they're they're slowly diminishing. And I think that's not because they're liberal and because they're establishment, uh, but because they pretend not to be. I think the most important thing in media is not objectivity, because objectivity when it comes to reporting is something you can strive for, but not something I think you can really ever achieve. You know, there's so much bias just down into what you include, what you don't, what stories you cover, what you don't, what your um, kind of range of acceptable opinion that you'll include Hmm. for who you interview, for who you quote. Uh, There's so many things that lead to bias in media coverage. I think what actually matters is being transparent about your media bias. Here's where I come from. Here's what my principles are. Here are the facts. Now here's my opinion. I think when people, when you do that, people don't have the same resentment towards you that they have if you're a CNN and you say, we're journal- journalizing, we're saving democracy, we're brave truth tellers, uh, and it's a fact, all these liberal opinions that we spout. <laughs> like That is what people cannot stand. And so I think there's a, a very big uh, kind of conservative media ecosystem, then there's also this big new media ecosystem. You know, somebody like Joe Rogan, he gets more viewers on an average podcast than CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC combined on their primetime broadcast. Yeah. And it's not even particularly close, actually. So I, I think that the, the legacy media is still very influential, for sure. And I do my best to work within it when I can. But if you offered me the choice between writing an op-ed for the New York Times or going on Joe Rogan, I would choose Joe Rogan because I, that's the future. And those things yep. are those things are only growing while the legacy media is only slowly, slowly bleeding out, I think. <laughs> yeah, it, it does seem like their days are kind of numbered to begin with. I mean, we saw, I think CNN tried to launch, what was it, like CNN, CNN on Plus. the go. Yeah, <laughs> CNN Plus. And it lasted all of like two and a half weeks before they were like, this is a disaster. We can't continue to operate this for very long at all. And there's also been a big shakeup there. I know they got rid of Brian Stelter and his show. And I think I think the CNN is kind of trying to seem like a little bit more objective, like especially now that Trump is out of office. I don't I know what they're trying to do over there. Late, Extremely. Yeah, I was like the time for that was maybe three, four years ago at the latest. Um, and then also, the, it does. I, I, I tend to agree with what you're saying, and I think that you can see some of the animosity and hostility between the legacy media and people like Joe Rogan, because he's constantly being crapped on in the legacy media outlets. There are all of these hit pieces that come out about him. Uh, there was the video of him you know, throwing around the N-word that was completely taken out of context. So it, it does sort of feel like the legacy media is lashing out somewhat, it is sort of this like lashing out with their final breath at all of the sort of new media people. 
um, it's it's very interesting to me, and I, I I do wonder what the lifespan is at this point for these kind of like terminally ter- terminally ill outlets. Like I I really wonder how much longer CNN and the Washington Post and even like NPR, like all of these other outlets, can continue to operate. I mean NPR has public funding, but yeah, it, it seems like they're not long for this world to begin with. I think that that you know the maybe the biggest ones will always be around because they'll be the hardcore Democrat partisan, uh, active progressives that will read and watch it every day. But you're all at some point you're talking about like three to five percent of the country, and you just can't sustain these massive multimedia um, conglomerates off of this anymore. That's why they're constantly shrinking. I just you know I, and I don't feel particularly bad for them. Generally, I don't like to cheer when people lose their jobs, like because especially in media where employment can be fickle. Like I'm not one of these people that went and celebrated Brian Stelter getting fired. However, he deserved to be fired, right? Like he was, uh, for folks that don't know, he was their like media ethics beat person, like on media bias and everything. And he's just, oh my God, just carried water for Democrats and did absolute hit jobs against conservative media all the time. And it's like his show had terrible ratings for a reason. And that's because people knew he was basically a democratic activist, which is fine, be a democratic activist, but then at least admit that that's what you're doing. Don't pretend to be some neutral arbiter of of objective journalism and facts and truth. There's also this preachiness to it. People really hate being condescended to. And I think that the, the kind of establishment liberal media is really condescending to people, yep. right? It's like, well, here's the the fact check on this because you can't possibly be expected to understand this thing. So here's what experts are saying. And then there's so much bias. Which experts? Very rarely do experts agree on something. But for the longest time, if you read the New York Times coverage of a COVID-related issue, they would only have a very certain subset of experts talk about it. Uh, not people who might have say, you know, actually those cloth masks don't seem to be doing anything. Or, you know, you still can spread COVID if you've been vaccinated. Like these are things that, think of the lab leak theory of COVID-19. Mm. The idea that in Wuhan, in this lab, uh, they had taken in the virus from some sort of animal, were experimenting or studying it, and accidentally it got loose. And that's how COVID started. Uh, that was originally banned from Facebook. It got you banned if you mentioned it because it was a conspiracy theory and misinformation. And here we are a year or two, a, a, a year later, Dr. Fauci says, actually, that's a legitimate theory. And then all these experts come out of the woodwork. But it's like there actually were a lot of people saying that. They just weren't being included in the conversation by the gatekeepers. But thanks to social media, the gatekeepers are really losing power and dwindling because it used to be that like if the newspapers wouldn't write about you, if the TV networks wouldn't have you on or cover your story, nobody was hearing about it. Now, I mean, there's so many ways to get it out there, and that's why they're slowly, slowly dying. Yeah, people don't like that hypocrisy and that condescension. I mean, another example was the the Kyle Rittenhouse thing was, you know, I think at one point you couldn't share that on Facebook. You couldn't say anything about him possibly being innocent. And it turned out he was innocent. And even CNN had legal analysts saying that he was innocent. I got uh, banned he was, from TikTok yeah. for saying he was that he defended himself. There after you go. The jury after the jury uh, acquitted him. That's unfathomable. I mean, that, the a, Kyle I mean Rittenhouse it is a is, communist app. So what do you expect? Yeah. But. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the, the Rittenhouse one was a, a huge one in terms of discrediting the media and the social media sphere. Well, and, sorry, yeah. just but just you know about sure. the Rittenhouse thing. What struck me about that is I I don't have the exact numbers in front of me because this was a while ago. But I remember seeing the data, the percentage of the public that thought Kyle Rittenhouse killed black people. The people he shot were white. They were not African American. But a huge swath of the public thought he killed black people because the establishment media coverage on MSNBC, CNN kept saying things like white supremacist tide or white nationalist rhetoric or all this stuff that like he shot other white dudes, right? But you would have so many people came away with the wrong impression of that story because of this. And for a lot of people, when there finally is a story that they realize they've been played, they'll never go back. 
Yeah. The, the Rittenhouse story is the one where I've never seen such a large number of people speaking to, you know, what, what you were talking about with the actual stats on this. I've never seen so many people have the basic facts wrong on a story, not not have an opinion that's a little bit of involves a little bit of conjecture or whatever, or they've got a couple of things wrong. I've never seen a story where so many people were so misinformed that it sounded like I mean, it sounded like a child trying to interpret the story at times. It was like these people have a child's understanding of what happened. They think that some white kid ran into Kenosha, Wisconsin and started indiscriminately shooting black people, which is like less than 1% true. There's like, the only thing that's true about that is that he shot people. And then he went to... Kenosha. Yeah, and now he went to Kenosha. (laughs) And of course, there's a part he drove over state lines with a weapon, all this stuff. So, I mean, yeah, people don't like that condescension and that hypocrisy. And I think part of what they're getting from the new media landscape is there's... There's an honesty there and a relatability. I mean, why do people love Joe Rogan so much? Because even though he is wrong sometimes, and he admits that on his show, there's a humanity to him where he feels relatable. And it's funny because he himself is a multi-multi-millionaire. He's not a regular guy. He's this, like, super fit, ultra-masculine. Like, he's in, like, the top 1% of 1% for masculinity. And, like, he's super rich. He's been in the entertainment industry for years. But he manages to just have this human core that I think a lot of online creators have. I mean, I'm not a big fan of Hassan Piker, but for what it's worth, he has some kind of appeal to you what know, I think is a very young so audience. It's so funny that you bring that up because... I'm kind of a fan of Hassan Pike. Oh, God. Now, look, I really? think he's wrong about everything. I think his okay. ideas are crazy. He says so many dumb things. But I love how wildly politically incorrect he can be, how few fucks he gives. And there's something about his down-to-earth style, the way he's just, you know, streaming, looking at stuff, talking to the chat. It's like he is extremely authentic. And that's what I do say about him. He's a nut job, ideologically, right? Like he said the U.S. deserves 9-11. <laughs> but, yeah. he, but I really do appreciate that about him. He, the way he talks about things and is so authentic and down to earth. And then he's in touch with young people. Like he's constantly looking at viral content, like games, Twitch. He's just, he's like 10 steps ahead of everyone else in political commentary and influencing in terms of knowing where the next generation is at. I think I would disagree with him on almost everything, but there is something about him that's Rogan-y in the way that he is authentic and down to earth. And like, of course, of course they're both like multimillionaires and and that doesn't, it's kind of the Trump phenomenon, how all the Trump was like this millionaire uh, celebrity guy, but all these working class people across America thought rightly or wrongly, that guy is it represents me. Why? Not because he's actually like them, but because he doesn't come off as hating them or judging them or thinking they're rubes. He comes off as sympathetic to them. Like he cares about people like me. Is actually, and this is one really interesting thing I've learned from covering politics. Basically, the most important question that a voter to tell you whether a voter is going to vote for one candidate or the other is not you know, what's their position on X, Y, or Z. It's, do you think this candidate cares about people like you? And if the answer is yes, they will vote for you. If the answer is no, they will not vote for you. The vast majority of the time. People will interpret that question in different ways. Race, socioeconomic class, parts of the country, whatever it may be. But if you give off these elite vibes that you don't care about people or that you judge people or you look down on certain people, the basket of deplorables comments, yeah. then they're never going to trust you or support you or anything. And that's the thing about some of these figures is they just don't come off like that. They come off yeah. like they have more respect for the common people or at least don't feel like they're better than them. And people are craving that because that's not what they've been served. Yeah, it, people want to, even if somebody on paper isn't relatable, like a Trump or Hassan Piker or Joe Rogan, these people are all, like you said, multimillionaires. People are looking for that human core where they see that ounce of humanity that somebody has that makes them feel like, I think this person has some of my interests at heart just because I can relate to them even the slightest bit. I mean, Hillary Clinton is on the opposite end of the spectrum, an example of somebody who just yeah. never on a human level could connect. And she's uh, I, you know, about the same levels of wealth as some of these other people. I know she's fantastically wealthy as well, but the problem was like she could Jeb. never... 
Yeah, or like Jeff, it's that they just came off always like like they were trying to sell you something that they didn't care about at all. They didn't really care about becoming president even. It was just to stroke their ego or whatever. And even though, I mean, look, Trump has a big ego too, and so does Hassan, and to some extent Rogan. But there are these moments with all of those figures, and of course I... <clears throat> People know I believe that both Hassan and Trump are particularly malignant figures, but what I'll give them is this. Hassan, I think, is sort of like a, a figure that I refer to as like Logan Paul plus politics. He just kind of is, because Logan Paul has a way of connecting with these like young guys who want to have swag and want to be cool. I'm a little too old for that. I'm 27 now, so I'm aged out a little bit of that. But it's, I sort I know what it's like to be like a 14 year old boy and to look up to certain types of guys. Hassan is very good at, at portraying that. And I, I could see how, because I think his audience is very, very young. I could see how they could be interested in his content, even if I think he is a absolutely malignant, terrible figure who who I, I think, I'll put it this way, I think he's authentically wrong. I think he actually does believe a lot of the stuff that he says. But then Trump is interesting because I would say I'm also not a fan of him, but one of the few times I felt like I could relate to Trump is when he's joking, like like actually telling funny jokes on the campaign trail. The other night I saw the clip of him being like, turn off the lights, turn off the lights, when they turned on the press lights at one of, and I was like, this is hilarious. I was like, some of this stuff is very funny. Some of the Pocahontas stuff I kind of got a kick out of with Elizabeth yeah. Warren, because she just walked right into it. And it's like, even just he, having a sense of humor, which again, Hillary Clinton, Jeb, these, these people do not have, it just makes people feel like, oh, this person is like me. Not completely. Again, might be very different in some ways. But this person has just a human core, yeah. just so, enough. Like I said, I did not vote for Trump in 2016. But I have this very clear memory from 2015. I was visiting some family, and I'm from Massachusetts, so I have a lot of family that's like very waspy. Like, you know, educated, old, white, liberals, hmm. that kind of, of people. You know, one of them's a professor, blah, blah, blah. And so I was visiting some of them once, and this was during the election, and they had the debate on. And this was the debate where Hillary Clinton goes, well, I'm just glad Donald Trump isn't in charge of law enforcement in this country. And he goes, because you'd be in jail. And then I, <laughs> I just burst out laughing. 18-year-old me is guffawing in this room. And all these stone-faced... 60-something WASP liberals are just looking at me mortified, like, oh, the indecency. And it's like, <laughs> I didn't like Trump, but I loved the fact that he was just, like, willing to just be real and not so... He wasn't... He, he didn't have a stick up his butt in terms of, oh, how could someone say something so indecent? Like, there was just something raw and real about that, that even as somebody who wasn't a fan of a lot of his policies and a lot of the things he said... I like I liked that element of it. Like he's actually willing to say the quiet part out loud that everybody thinks. And and you know this is they, we're increasingly becoming a society of self censorship, right? Where people there's a huge gap. I wrote about this recently. There's a huge gap between what people actually believe and what they're willing to say their public positions are. That is mm -hmm. really bad, right? Uh, for a country that leads to more polarization, more distrust. Uh, decline in, in your communities, your sense of community, and, you know, the, the debates and the expression and the back and forth that makes the kind of whole First Amendment marketplace of ideas work. Well, people are too afraid now to even say what they actually think about things. They're afraid of being canceled, of being called a bigot, of having a boycott, of like, whatever it may be, we have really, really regressed on that front, I think, over the last decade or two. And that's really bad. I don't know another way to say it. Other than that, that is uh, simply not sustainable, right? I mean, there, there was that yep. phenomenon of quiet Trump voters. I knew people like this who would never admit it publicly, and then they voted for Trump 100% hardcore when they went in the ballot box. And it's like, you're only going to prompt and engender more of that kind of backlash when you have these these people who are so elitist who feel like they're looking down on the part of the country people still might not admit it if we keep doing this cancel culture stuff but they'll just get increasing increasingly more radical in their backlash i think yeah it, you're absolutely right about the the self-censorship and kind of the chill that's come over the country particularly since particularly since trump was elected i think there kind of became this thing where people saw 
anything that seemed even remotely right wing as like toxic and you can't associate with it. And it kept them from pushing back on really extreme stuff on the left. A lot of the extreme stuff that I think people are afraid to talk about has to do with, you know, like gender ideology, some of the more extreme things in the trans activism world and stuff like that. You mentioned before that you are an openly gay person on the right. And I know that you've had a couple of run ins with the kind of like LGBT activist world, particularly, you know, coming from the left. Uh, One of the things was that you kind of spoke out against some of the kinky stuff going on with the pride parades and things like that and some of the BDSM imagery and all of that that's going on. I I just wanted to ask you in your own words, kind of what was your position on that 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 seemed to get you in a little bit of hot water with the woke left side of things in the the LGBT activist world? Yeah, look, I've kind of always said that I'm somebody who on social issues is kind of middle of the road, maybe center right. Uh, And so when I'm around like woke liberals, I feel like WTF, am I um, Phyllis (laughs) Shafley now? Uh, but when I'm around conservatives, I'm like, whoa, I'm an I'm a libertarian. Like this, y'all are crazy over here. So I, I I've clashed with both the far left social justice crowd and the you know hard right ultra traditionalist social conservative crowd. But in terms of the woke left, I mean, I've said things, and you know, I would go back and say some of it differently, maybe. But just my general thesis is simply that like two things that have gotten me in trouble is saying that kink should not be conflated with LGBT. There's a lot of events that are like LGBT leather weekend or something. And I'm like, you're not doing anyone a favor by conflating your immutable characteristics, which I believe sexual orientation is. You can't choose to be gay. You can't choose to be straight with certain habits that people choose to engage in that have stigma. And look, I'm not even a huge stigma person. Like I really don't care. But I'm simply, my point is, don't conflate these things. We didn't fight Mm -hmm. for gay rights to then have it be tainted as the same thing as, you know, masochism and BDSM, right? Like, that's not what it is. And so I've pushed back on that, which then gets you uh, vitriolic backlash from the people who think it's all intersectional and you have to have unfettered, you know, libertinism for everything, and I, I just don't believe that. I don't agree with that. But then the other thing that I've said is, look, I know you talked to Buck Angel uh, on your show before, and he's he's a very important voice on this. But mm-hmm. I have a lot of compassion for people who are uh, have gender dysphoria, right? I think they're a very very small segment of the society of society is born into experiencing intense gender dysphoria from a young age. And those people um, who truly it persists in, I think when they are at the age of consent, 16, 17, 18, whatever your state may be, maybe medically transitioning is the right thing for them. And if they do, power to them. Live your life. Like, I really will have no problem accepting that. The two things I've spoken out on that make no sense are irreversibly medically transitioning children. The idea that you're going to give puberty blockers well, first off, puberty blockers, are, they're not the pause button that woke activists say they are. They have life, life imp- implicating long-term ramifications. And then, the, you know, the, the cross hormone, the surgery, these kinds of things that, that are happening at 13, 14, 15, 16, these can sterilize a person. These are totally irreversible. Um, they can make it so a person can never experience an orgasm. And... All of this, when so many of these teenagers may well grow out of it, actually a statistically significant portion of people who are confused about their gender grow up and are actually just a feminine gay man or a butch lesbian woman. And that should be fine. So I I just don't think that you're, until you're old enough to consent and make decisions about your body like an adult, you shouldn't be making irreversible changes uh, in terms of medically transitioning. I think that should uh, not be allowed, frankly. Um, And so that gets you in big hot water. The other thing is sports. I've been an athlete my whole life, nothing crazy, never went to the Olympics, right? Like, but I played high school soccer and our high school boys team, uh, of which I was captain, wasn't very good. We lost most of our games. The girls team was significantly better. They won most of their games. When we scrimmaged, we still whooped them 5-0 easily. Like, it, there are differences between the sexes that exist in sports. And so when you pretend otherwise, I've never had a problem with, for example, 
the idea of transgender men who are biologically female. If they want to compete in men's sports, I don't care because they're only putting themselves at a disadvantage. Hmm. But for transgender women who are biologically male, they're born. Obviously, there are things like height and bone density and hip width and lots of things that even with um, estrogen therapy do not go away. (laughs) So I just think that's reality. And I felt gaslit by kind of the trans activists who act like that's somehow hateful to acknowledge or want to take into account in sports. Um, but at the same time, you know, I do think there's a there's a portion of the right, the, the old school social conservatives, who genuinely are transphobic in the sense that they think transgender people are gross and disgusting and bizarre and they want them to not exist. Mm-hmm. I really increasingly, they want, they like they just have no compassion or space in their heart for the idea that some portion of people genuinely as adults want, will live differently like this. And, and I think I've increasingly come to feel that way. So I actually think the positions I've just outlined, sensibility with children and sports, letting adults live however they want, is something that like most people in America would mm-hmm. generally agree with. But on Twitter, on either side, <laughs> that makes you either um, <laughs> like a woke leftist, who wants to destroy, you know, <clears throat> womanhood in the eyes of the trad cons, or a sellout crypto fascist who who wants to, I don't know, get kids killed because they can't get the treatment they need or some terrible thing. It's like on the, the online extremes, there's just no space for nuance on any of this. But that's why I have to remind myself that these online spaces aren't really real life, and that sometimes when I'm getting dragged or ratioed for you know, taking one of the, the positions that I've just said, it's only because I'm dealing with an echo chamber of the most extreme, like 2% of one side of the aisle. And then actually most people would find those those views pretty commonsensical. Yeah, it, it's, it's unfortunate because I absolutely agree that the vast majority of, of what you just said is all perfectly mainstream opinion. It's where the median voter is on these issues. It's where most people are, is that they want to have compassion for everybody in the kind of LGBT Q plus sphere. I, I I do have a tendency to forget some of the letters that have been added on, but the, the everything you know, after it, it, T is fake. Yeah, that's, that's I usually only say LGBT. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, in that whole sphere, sometimes it's a joke. I'll be like LGBT one two three dory me to the third power. You know, whatever's added in there. But I mean, everything you said it does strike me as very mainstream opinion perfectly reasonable stuff and part of consensus building is that you need people in the center to kind of like be the ones to parse out the actual solutions to these issues like okay when are we going to let people medically transition where are we going to draw those lines how are we going to handle it when people either have a diagnosis of gender dysphoria or they don't how are we going to handle sports it's very hard to actually problem solve when you have the loudest voices on the left and right saying no compromise nothing and I, I think that there is a sense on both the left and the right on this issue that if you give an inch, the other side's going to take a mile. And that is some of the impetus for what's happening. I think people on the right feel that if you try to help people who do have a gender dysphoria diagnosis, who clearly are struggling mentally, and maybe the answer isn't for them to transition, but maybe it is. And they think that if you let them do that, it's just going to be like, okay, then the categories of men and women won't exist anymore. And I understand that fear a little bit because on the left, you do see these attempts to totally deconstruct even biological sex. I mean, sometimes on the left, there'll be people saying there's no such thing as biological sex, which is batshit insane. (laughs) I will never on this show ever debate that because it is just too (laughs) crazy. But the other thing is, I mean, you know, you have all these people saying, I'm not a biologist, but, you know, and then on the left though, I think people feel like if they put any limitations on some of their more extreme positions, like, okay, maybe we take things slow with kids. Maybe we don't, you know, you put kids in certain environments where maybe it's not appropriate, which isn't really a trans thing. It's more of like the, the pride stuff. But I think they feel like if they give an inch on those, then they're gonna get to the point where it's like, okay, it's gonna be illegal to be gay or trans in this country. I think there's this, fear of giving an inch because you're so afraid that the other side's going to take a mile. And I don't know how we get through that impasse without the people in the center, because your positions are pretty close to mine, Brad, from what you uh, articulated. I don't, you know, I feel like people like us need to take control of the conversation, but I don't know how we can, because unfortunately the audience for the more nuanced conversation on this topic is relatively small, whereas it seems like the audience for the more extreme stuff is quite large. 
Right, but even though the more extreme stuff is actually often the minority opinion, it's because of the... This is the same thing. This might seem like a weird comparison, but bear with me. This is the same problem that plagues our primary systems. The fact that in your Republican primary for president or your Democrat primary, you, the voters who decide who the nominee is are only the ones who will show up for an off election, who are the most involved, the most hyperactive, pay the closest attention. And so it ends up being like the most extreme 30% of Democrats and the most extreme 30% of Republicans. So the final nominee will be much more extreme than the actual um, party at large, or let alone the general electorate. And that's the same thing that happens here is that you know, the, the vast middle on these issues. Same thing with abortion, actually, though. That's a whole other Pandora's box. But there is kind of a consensus that a lot of people would agree on. Some restrictions, but not complete bans, um, aren't super passionate about it. The people who are super passionate tend to be on one extreme or the other. So they're the ones that donate to groups. They're the ones that go to events. They're the ones that constantly consume content about it. And then the people with the kind of middle of the road position are more apathetic and way less engaged. And then the engaged minority essentially is able to hijack the conversation. What the solution to that is, frankly, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, other than people becoming more engaged. And I think I, I do wonder sometimes how bad the extremes have to get. I mean, do we literally have to have... Marjorie Taylor Greene versus Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in a presidential election before people realize, huh, maybe I should vote in my primary so they don't so that five people don't show up and put a nutcase. Right? Like I I recently moved and I registered to vote and I started voting in primaries. Uh and what percentage of 24-year-olds do that? I don't know, mm -hmm. but it's pretty darn small. Not a lot. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate because by by their very definition, the people who are closer to the center have a tendency to have a lot of other things going on in their lives. Like a lot of these people are like parents, people who've mellowed out a little bit, who are in their 30s, 40s and 50s, maybe older people like the 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 young activist crowd or the people who are like actually on or the, the total or retirees online. who have all their free time and just watch far right news all day. Right. Yeah, it's they don't have that much else that they have to be doing. So they can just spend all day getting kind of radicalized online or on Twitter or by Fox News if you're watching too much of that. And it's it's so hard. But I do think that we do have to kind of mobilize the center in some way. And unfortunately, it's very hard to do that in a two party system. Uh, I think, you know, there have been some kind of half hearted attempts. I, I like Andrew Yang a lot. I've actually been trying to get him on the show. I think he's a nice guy, but the forward party has kind of had uh, some optical uh, issues. I uh, love because Yang, but the forward party's a joke. It's, the platform yeah. is just let's all have rainbows and cupcakes and <laughs> common sense. Solutions. Like, oh, we'll hash it out later. Yeah, yeah, with zero yeah. actual specifics. <laughs> yeah, and I, I look, I, you know, I, I even, I actually voted for him in the primary, I think, a couple years ago. But yeah, I've been a little disappointed that I, I think that what what Yang is doing and the the mistake there is he's thinking that okay, that is how you mobilize the center is just by saying like, hey, let's just have this nice, open minded, pretty pony yeah. thing. And it's like, no, 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 you do have to capture the desires of the center, which are for these common sense solutions but if you're not willing to stake out those positions like you mentioned abortion i happen to have the exact position you were talking about before my position has always been on abortion that it should be broadly unrestricted in the first trimester and broadly restricted in the in the last two with maybe some exceptions i know that is the consensus position in the united states but i get attacked by the left and right for having that position because it doesn't satisfy anyone that's a hard thing to do and if people like Andrew Yang aren't willing to do that, and I know uh, Brett Weinstein, who I'm also kind of a fan of, he had the weird unity ticket thing going on a couple years ago that it just started way too late and that kind of fell flat on its face. Um, I, I, I appreciated what he was doing. And uh, I, like him, actually wrote in Tulsi Gabbard's name for president in 2020. So I can relate to Brett a lot oh, in his desires. I met her but... recently. Yeah? Our Aloha yeah. Mommy. She is. Yeah. <laughs> she's very cool. She served our country. She's very interesting. But she is also just drop dead gorgeous, and I love everyone her says fashion. that. Yeah, I love her style. Uh, my favorite. So I covered the twenty twenty presidential campaign closely as a political mm -hmm. journalist. 
uh, and, and including the especially the Democratic presidential primary. And my favorite moment was when Tulsi Gabbard went on stage wearing this full white pants suit in the liberal media, like the New York Times style section, called it like cultish, uh, radical, bizarre, blah, 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 blah. I don't have the exact quote. I went back and looked. A few years before, the New York Times style section, not even just the same section of the same publication, the same author had written that Hillary Clinton, in a very similar full white pantsuit, was feminist and bold and brave. And it just made my brain explode. It, yeah. The, I mean, Tulsi was targeted because she just, she refused to sort of give in to the left-right spectrum and just go along with, I think she, actually, she was, speaking of abortion, she was the only candidate, I think even Yang kind of shied away from this, which was maybe kind of a, a sign of what was to come with him. But Tulsi was the only candidate on stage who, when they brought up abortion, would say that there should be any limits at all, uh, which a lot of uh, men in particular, I think, are just, wait, they always default to, like, it's a woman's choice, I don't want to talk about it because nobody wants to be called a misogynist, which I've been called many times for my position on abortion, which, again, is the mainstream position position um yeah Tulsi, Tulsi's fantastic that's another person I've I emailed her people the other day she's you know I have a whole list of people who are kind of on my reach list like like Tulsi and Yang I know they're hard, hard to get a hold of but uh yeah T Tulsi is such an interesting figure because she sometimes I wonder if she might just become an independent or a Republican at some point I think she's still a Democrat last I checked but her positions know. are I was actually yeah. surprised that in 2020 she endorsed Biden but now she's been yes. very critical of him yeah, and, and her so positions... She, thought, she, may ha she may well have buyer's remorse on that. Yeah, well, and she's even spoken out about the, the trans sports stuff. I mean, her positions are really out of step with those, those liberal activists. But because now she left Congress, and so she, she just really can just say whatever she thinks. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Um, I'm really, really interested in the trajectory of her career. She, uh, she guest hosted... Tucker Carlson, I think. Yeah, that still blows <laughs> my night. mind. Yeah, I mean, that's... I, I, her, her career in the Democratic Party is over. I mean, it's yeah. just, I, I don't know what her future holds. I, I, I think she's been great on a lot of issues. But uh, I'm really curious about what role exactly she's going to play. I mean, I'll say this. If there were an election between... Oh, this, we were talking about how you mobilize the center. I mean, if there's an election between Trump and Biden or like Trump and Kamala or something in 2024 and Tulsi Gabbard were to run a third party campaign, I know they say third party campaigns are quixotic, but I would absolutely, I'd be like, sign me up. Like, I, I can't bring myself to vote for Biden or Trump at this point. I would almost certainly write someone in uh, for a second time <laughs> if that were to happen again. I mean, yeah, I, don't I don't think know, I would vote yeah. for either of them. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Brad, this has been a good conversation. I know you were a little bit short on time, so today's going to be a, a shorter episode. But before we sign off, I wanted to ask if there's anything you wanted to plug or promote on the show today. Anything you yeah. want to you know, put your social media out there and all that stuff. If people like hearing me blather for the last 45 minutes, they might like my podcast. It's called Based Politics, co-hosted with Hannah Cox. Just search wherever you listen to podcasts or go to my YouTube channel, just Brad Palumbo. All right, people, check that stuff out. Thanks for listening today, and thanks again to Brad for being on the show. You know the drill. If you're on iTunes, I want you to leave a five-star review. If you're on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what you thought of today's conversation with Brad. Thank you so much, and I'll see you guys next time on the Veritas Podcast.